I want you to get together. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Nephilim Look Like Clowns. Now today I've got a, a few things I want to meander through, some connections I've been making since my previous video that I think you guys will find quite interesting. Now in my previous video I went through um, a few topics, going through the Gorgonesque imagery found all around the world in different uh, stylistic art forms and mediums. One of them was the, uh, the tiki mask here which I was looking through, um, coming off of the Maori inspiration, the Maori artwork, which shows a lot of Gorgonesque creatures sticking their tongue out. Uh, now, obviously, I went into the tongue sticking out motif quite deep into those other videos, but today we're going we're gonna to bring it into well, something, something different. I've been kind of meandering through shamanism. Now, from Tiki Masks here, you can see this wild look to the imagery, you know, this big wide smile, grin, uh, large bulging eyes, elongated features, long faces and heads and foreheads kind of come into the imagery of a tiki mask with the natural reptilian snake-like uh, multicolored fractal designs. Um, I mean, you, you can look at these and it's quite clear that they're, they're trying to donate something clown-like jesterish and or demonic but from looking at these i uh started to meander into totem poles as well obviously from first nation um tribes indian tribes in uh, america alaska canada you know the totem pole along the uh, pacific coast mainly i think are, are quite a common occurrence and as with most things like this the, the reasonings behind them are shrouded in occulted mysteries only um, taught to the initiated members of the tribes and not to outsiders. Uh, to outsiders, they look like interesting pieces of artwork, but to those on the inside, you know, these represent gods, deities, ancestral spirits, stories that the tribes have told about past events. And, you know, very little is actually known about most of what these represent, but you look at them and I think knowing what we know about the Nephilim giants, of the past ruling over mankind at one point i think we can look at these these depictions in these old totem poles in a new light so look at this one for example that's on the screen right now what we're seeing is a giant with clown-like features a big wide red-lipped toothy grin red nose paint on the face um a giant eating a human and I think we've understood that these giants did terrorize mankind by eating them and here we see it depicted on a totem pole so maybe um this is a good piece of evidence for us to be using to show that this stuff is true you know this stuff really happened and ancient oral tradition tribes have been retelling these stories for generations and they do it through artwork like the totem pole I mean, we'll look, just look at some of these first before we move on. I mean, here we have another one. White, pale skin, like a clown. A red nose, like a clown. Big, wide, red-lipped grin, like a clown. A high brow ridge, large, bulging eyes. Not uh, dissimilar from a serpent. Clownish features here on an old totem pole. And then we look in the background and we see what look like bizarre, animalistic, human, hybrid monsters with sharp teeth you know and we're told oh these are just you know these are just uh, animal spirits or something but they don't look like any animal i know or that we would know of other than the eagle which is a whole of the symbol used within the occult <sighs> ad nauseum but this whole winged spirit motif is common across many cultures you know it's, it's even used on the back of the gorgon um, it's used in a lot of Sumerian and uh, Babylonian architectural imagery as well. Um, and obviously Quetzalcoatl was known as the winged serpent also in Aztec cultures. So these similar motifs run through many cultures, you know, and um, they all have their own artistic, stylistic way of depicting it. But I think we're looking at the same thing. Um, I mean, here's another example, you know, look at this one. Very clown-like, you know... And I look at this artistic style, and it's not dissimilar from a lot of Japanese artwork we see as well, you know. And I think 
around the Pacific Rim, there is a, a commonality between the, the artwork created that represents these Nephilim spirits. But look at these, proper psychedelic imagery. Clown-like features, you know. The reds, the blues, the whites. Um, really, really, really common. I mean, look at this one. Looks like some kind of monster, giant, lizard thing holding on to a human. I'm not sure. I mean, look at this one. This is uh, maybe a mother and child, you could say. Or a giant and a human, perhaps. Because notice the features on the uh, the giant are a lot different from the features on the face of this baby, supposedly. More exaggerated on the giant. Just as we saw with that image I showed you at the top before. I mean, this one again, with the red nose. I mean, if these are supposed to depict humans, I don't know many humans that have red flaring nostrils contrasted with a line to the peak of the nose I, I, it just doesn't you don't really see that in humanity sure we have pale people who can get a bit of a red nose when they get a cold but not to this extent i mean in the background of this image you can see some kind of humanoid lizard reptilian wide grinned uh, beast as well and again this one you know a giant eating a human Notice that the human being hasn't got these flared nostrils. Um, you know, looks, just looks a lot more uh, akin to how we look. But these monsters depicted on the totem poles, they don't look very human at all. I don't think they look even close to human. Or even like any animals that we would know of. I mean, look at this one. What kind of animal is this supposed to be uh, depicting? You know... This is this is a clown, if I've ever seen one, right here on a totem pole, um, passed down through all traditions of, of supposedly ancient cultures, you know. But yeah, from this, as you can see here, I'll let you guys do your own little research into totem poles, but the more you look into them, the more, the more clownish the features become. But while scrolling through, I saw this image here, and I was like, what is this jester-looking fool? Uh, where does this come from, you know? So I went on to look into what these things were actually about, and it turns out they're a common practice in uh, South Korea from their old folk religions, and they're essentially guardians to ward away negative spirits. Um, they are known as the Jang Sweng. Uh, I, think, I think I'm pronouncing that right, excuse me if I'm not. Uh, but they're usually made by uh, traditional shamans of the folk tradition, and they are put around the uh, the borders of villages um, in order to ward away negative spirits and demons. Um, a form of protection of some kind. But these are basically what are known as Korean totem poles to me and you. Yeah, so a, a Jang Sweng or a village guardian is a Korean totem pole usually made of wood. Jang Swengs were traditionally placed at the edges of villages to mark a village boundary and frighten away demons. They were also worshipped as village tutelary deities, so teacher gods. In the southern regions of Joella, um, Jansuens are also referred to as Bopsu, Byoksu, a variation of Boxer, meaning a male shaman. So the representations of shamans, essentially, and shamans are seen as intermediate intermediaries between the spirit realm and the physical world in pretty much every culture that practices shamanism. So yeah, these, these are interesting, these totem poles of South Korea. So I was looking into some imagery involving these things. And they come with naturally clownish imagery and features. So what is the traditional inspiration for these characters? You know, there's always one that wears this, um, what looks like a hat to me and you. Then the, the other one always has what seems like a spike through the hair to hold up the hair. Um, I think it's a common... Uh, practice in Korea and China and Japan to stylize the hair this way um, but they usually come in a pair and they usually have this demonic joker jester like thing going on so I was looking at this you know and I was looking at the, the what looks like a top hat to me and you in the west you know a lot, of, a lot of them are depicted with this top hat of some kind and from this you know I, I went a bit deeper into uh, South Korean shamanism and uh, 
some of the things I found out are, are quite incredible, and I think I think this is a, a credible connection to the research we did on the Hatman entity in relation to these these clown-like entities in the spirit realm, because the Hatman is a reoccurring theme I found across cultures um, in relations to demons. So looking further into this, let's look at shamanism in Korea. So, a Korean shaman is what's known as a, a mudang. Now, a mudang, by many people today, is considered, um, by a lot of Koreans, uh, charlatans, you know, um, people who are far removed from the tradition and just uh, do this for money now. And there's quite a lot of uh, controversy over these characters within Korea, but... It's an oral tradition. It's been passed down as a folk tradition through Korea for, for a long time, for, you know, thousands of years. Um, it's polytheistic, promoting belief in a range of deities. Um, both these deities and ancestral spirits are deemed capable of interacting with living humans and causing them problems. Central to the religion are ritual specialists, the majority of them female, called the Madang. Um, in English, they have sometimes been called shamans, although the validity of this is contested. Uh, the Madang assists paying clients in determining the cause of misfortune using divination. So they do this by performing a ritual called a cut, in which the gods and the ancestral spirits are given offerings of food and drink and entertained with song and dance. Uh, these may take place in a private home or at a shrine, often located on a mountain. Uh, there are various subtypes of Mudang whose approach is often informed by regional traditions. Um, the rituals involve them being personally possessed by deities or ancestral spirits. It's not always possession. Some of them instead entail spirit mediumship, but not possession. So basically, this is, this is what we see in quite a lot of traditions, even in Africa, is the worship and willing self-possession of um, ancestors. So ancestor worship is, is extremely common in most pagan traditions. Um, they believe they're communing with their, their dead relatives. However, a lot of them also understand that what they call ancestor spirits are in fact just plain demons. Um, we know them as the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Um, I don't believe your family members are trapped behind the veil uh, or wander in spirit form on earth when they die. I don't think that's the case. That's not the biblical uh, way of viewing it. I think the only spirits that are dead and still wandering the earth are the Nephilim. And I do believe they have deceived many cultures currently into worshipping them by claiming to be their ancestors and offering them wisdom through these rituals where they connect with them. So I was reading into this anyway, and there's some strange practices involved with this. Um, you can go into the history of this and, and how it's spread throughout the Korean uh, regions, how it's come and gone, how they've been demonized and then loved, and then it, it, it's, a, it's a rich tradition. There's a lot going on here. Um, but the common motifs which we're looking at in this series are that they dress in these multicolored clothings, as you can see here. Um, it's usually blue, red, and yellow. Um, I think they are the colours of their tradition. Um, but the dance they do involves holding these knives and tridents. And they do this dance in which they basically, it explains in here, they, they get possessed. And then they cut themselves. But they don't take any damage. Because they're being protected by the spirit that's possessing them, basically. And we've seen similar practices before in, in uh, South America. There's a lot of this going on. Um, also, I think there was a series uh, years ago about demon magicians. I think a YouTuber called Zendrius created, where it showed a lot of these magicians doing things that should be killing them. Uh, but it's not, because they are being protected by demons, basically. They've made deals with the devil, they would say. Um... But yeah, you look into the beliefs of the Madang, um, and it's funny because the, 
the tradition of Musok, which the Modang is a part of, is polytheistic. Uh, supernatural beings are called Quisin or Sin. So I thought that was a, a funny coincidence, obviously. These these supernatural beings are literally called Sin. Um, they divide these beings into two main groups, the gods and the ancestral spirits. Although they may use the term Sin for all of them. So they have the gods on the other side and they have the ancestral spirits on the other side. Uh, supernatural beings are seen as volatile. If humans do well by them, they can receive good fortune. But if they offend these entities, then they may suffer. Which is naturally always the case when you end up dealing with demons. Uh, devotees of these deities believe they can engage, converse and bargain with them. So they make deals with these entities for good luck. Uh, wealth, health, all sorts of things, you know, whatever, whatever the human usually desires, you know, they'll find a way of getting it through these demons. That's their way of doing it in this tradition. Um, each Madang will have their own pantheon of deities, and that may offer, uh, basically what it's saying here, each Madang has encountered so many different demons over the, the, the life that they uh, have their own gods, I suppose, from their own personal encounters with the individual spirits. Um, but it goes on here to explain if I can find it. So yeah, um, the highest deities are often deemed remote and with little interest in human affairs. So I suppose these would be considered maybe the fallen angels of the past, the ones that created these these offspring spirits to begin with. But some of the more powerful deities can make demands from humans without any obligation to reciprocate. So they're quite prideful disrespectful don't really care about humans um other deities are involved in everyday human concerns and pray to accordingly so you get these ones who are actively involved in the the uh, everyday activities of mankind you know so these would be to us as christians you know the the foot soldier demons who are keeping an eye on humans and doing everything they can to lead them astray at every possible moment um you know the spirits of the dead are thought to yearn for activities and pleasures they enjoyed in life, it says here. And we know that the Nephilim want to possess humans so they can experience the pleasures that they once enjoyed in life when they had a body. They don't have a body anymore, so they want to use yours and your senses and your nervous system to experience those things. And it says that's a well understood practice to the shamanistic religion here. So let's go on to the main the main uh, event here so you know the madang perform a ritual called a cut and here's an example of a madang performing the cut ritual here and note the hat so never mind the clownish colorful clothing but they're also wearing this 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 tr trilby like um hat and this to me looks just like the same hat seen on the shadow entity known as the hat man which has tormented thousands of people. There are so many first-hand accounts of encounters with this this shadow demon that wears a hat. And uh, obviously the shamans mimic this. Now it's said that uh, this tradition, the Madang tradition, may have its roots from Siberian uh, shamanism. And here's an example of a Siberian shaman wearing the same hat. And it seems to be a common common theme maybe in the east that shamans wore this this hat figure and the shape of the hat you know i think it's probably an emulation of the nephilim and perhaps the nephilim of the past did wear hats like this because they had skulls shaped like this it was just a way of accommodating the shape of their head um it's it's been theorized by other people but this seems to be the reason for this so you know this this these entities in in spirit form perhaps they had protrusions that were shaped like this hat it wasn't simply that they were wearing a hat i'm not 100 percent, but there's something going on here as this reoccurring imagery of the shaman wearing this hat does keep cropping up and people do encounter demons specifically wearing these hats so i think this explains why we see a lot of these uh these totem poles wearing these hats as well because they're representing the shaman the protector of the village 
um, and that's why the top hat is a very common motif with these uh, these totem poles, these Korean poles. Here we go again. You know, so back to the Madang here performing the cut. So during this ritual, from what uh, I can summarize here quickly, is uh, they're usually hired by somebody rich to perform a ritual to cleanse negative spirits from their home or to get advice on how to deal with a, a particularly tricky situation the family is going through. They're quite private things um, and they uh, aren't usually performed publicly. It's usually just to a few people and paying clients. But they do this ritual um, where they do dances, uh, do strange things with knives, offer food and meat and um, burn things. And then the very end of the ritual is possession. And it's it's expected that possession will come at the end. Um, and if it's if it doesn't happen, you know, then it's it's considered a failed event. So the possession phase takes place at the climax of the ritual. In some cut traditions, the modang will stand upon an earthen jar while doing so. Um, possessed speech is called gongzu. Words from the possessing entity will then be spoken to the assembled persons by the madang. Over the course of the cut, a mansin may be possessed by a succession of different supernatural entities. Um, so yeah, basically then they would give the advice needed or the, the, whatever it is these people want from the spirits on the other side. The madang will act as an intermediary so they can communicate with them. So this is no different than the Western traditions of seances, you know, uh, communing with, communicating with the dead with the, with the crystal ball or everyone holding hands around the table and someone gets possessed and starts speaking through them. This is no different than playing with Ouija boards. This is just more of a culture that has a direct line through personal possession of a particular individual known as a Madang. So what they would also do uh, the Madang may stab themselves in the chest with knives, run blades along their tongue, or press it to their face and hands. Riding knives is termed uh, Jack uh, Duggery, Jack Duggery, and involves the Madang walking barefoot on upturned blades of the knife, sometimes speaking in Gongsu, or possessed speech. Practitioners claim that if the spirits that prevent the Madang from being cut by the blade and the ability to undertake such dangerous acts without harm is regarded as evidence for the um, efficiency of the right. Some practitioners acknowledge instances in which they have been cut by blades. Um, this has become expectant part of the stage cinematic cut. So it's expected that these people will try to cut themselves with knives and prove that they can't be injured anymore because they are possessed by a demon who's protecting them. Uh, so, you know, the, these en what I'm trying to show here, guys, really, is these entities are still worshipped today and they are used in order to gain power. So here's another example of a hat man <laughs> person, you know, a shaman, um wearing this hat, you know, and performing his rituals and his offerings to them. Uh, these, these people, the Madang, are just one of many types of cultures that, that use shamanism and commune with what they call ancestor spirits, which are just the Nephilim, and it, it's just another way of gaining power. Um, one interesting thing it does say about the Madang, however, is that none of them who have been interviewed claim that they ever wanted to actually become one. Um, they were kind of forced into it. So it says here, the typical prerequisite for becoming a Madang is to suffer misfortune. With practitioners believing that the deities torment a person with misfortune, illness or madness to alert them to the deity's desire that they become a Madang. They often report fearful encounters with spirits prior to becoming a Madang. Um, instances are through dreams. Um, these dreams and visions may reveal which deities the future Madang is expected to serve. 
So you know, these people are terrorized, put into an extreme state of fear through horrible visions and dreams by demons, heavily demonized to the point where they are tricked into thinking that they're supposed to open themselves up to these beings. And through no choice of their own, they then become the shaman. You know, a common motif in the biographies of Madang is the claim that they encounter divine beings or spirit guides while wandering in a wild environment. Uh, they may be compelled by spirit voices or visions or drawn by compulsion to go to a temple, shrine or sacred mountain. You know, so... Everyone who became a shaman never really wanted to be one. They were kind of just uh, pushed into it by demons <laughs> speaking to them and terrorizing them. So I think it's it's very interesting that even though all this negativity comes along with it, and they acknowledge that the demons are pretty evil and, and careless and need placating by giving them nice shiny things, they still continue to worship them and consider them good. You know, and in Korea, South Korea, so actually, you know, Christianity has has grown exponentially over the 20th century to the point where there are a large contingent now of Koreans who see these people for what they are and often call them out as just demon worshipping charlatans. Um, but, you know, they still have their followers and they still have their cults running today. So there you go. That's all I can really say about the Madang, you know. One thing I do want to point out is this hat man motif that comes along with the profession, you know, and this hat man demon is a global phenomena, you know, and it seems to be a common in um, Asian uh, shamanism. Fascinating. So the ancestral spirit worship, no different from in Africa, you know, they have their ancestral spirit worship too. And what they do is they put on masks, they dress up like their ancestor spirit gods in order to be possessed by them during their rituals. Um, I've talked about it a lot in previous videos, um, but it's worth recapping here that it's just the same practice on a completely different continent um, with the same wild clothing and garb you know in europe they have the uh the wildermen rituals um and they also look crazy with the things they wear you know um every culture has it it's the same thing uh, paganism and shamanism is extremely common you know and in the modang tradition they use bells and noises because they believe it attracts these spirits and bells and whistles are used in a lot of uh European traditions in order to attract these spirits, you know, these pagan costumes often come adorned with bells. Here's one example of it here, and it doesn't take long to find these, but the tradition is always the same. Um, it doesn't matter which culture it comes from. If you're dealing with pagan shamanism, they all have the same tricks um, and a similar look and motif. So you see this thing here in uh, European paganism. Does that look much different than the totem poles we were looking at here um, in the Pacific? I don't think so. It's just the these winged these winged things, you know, these winged entities that we call eagles on the top of these totem poles, and uh, not dissimilar from what you just saw there, worn by this shaman fascinating so yeah in terms of one quick thing to sum up here you know with the hat man you know we have baron semedi is another prime example of the hat man we see a lot of musicians wearing this as well i think of slash as one main main version of it but there's something about this hat i think i may have to go into it a lot deeper in another video um really focusing on on this hat and who wears them most commonly and why were they so popular during the turn of the uh, the turn of the century and the rise of industrialism you know what, what was it about this style and fashion exactly um my first hint right now it has something to do with representing the elongated skull of the nephilim rulers a way of uh, venerating them if you are considering yourself a shaman who's communing with them directly or somebody of a higher elite status above all of mankind, then why not wear the hat that represents godliness and kingship like they used to? I'm not sure, but that's my theory so far. 
So a bit of fun to sum up this now, guys. Um, one thing I mentioned in my recent live show, the Truth of Therapy sessions, you know, I went really deep into um, AI and all sorts of things, all sorts of topics. You should go check it out if you haven't. But one thing I did talk about, which I want to bring into this, is uh, about a film from 1986 called Vamp. Absolutely awful movie. Um, a piece of hot eight is garbage. You know, this is not not something you should go and you would enjoy if you watched it. Really, um, not memorable. Terrible acting. Terrible storyline. Just ridiculous. Um, but it's kind of like a comedy horror in a sense. It's two guys who go out to look for a stripper, and basically, and they end up at this bar full of vampires. Um, and then it's about trying to escape the ordeal, basically. Um, but there's one bizarre, strange scene in it which involves the actress Gloria Jones uh, doing doing a dance. And she dances <laughs> around this mannequin that's covered in black and white fractaled patterns. You know, and I've, I've talked for a long time that um, the Nephilim had this thing going on on their skin, not like dissimilar from the skin of an adder, let's say, who often as a snake has black and white uh, patterns all over it and also we've we've theorized that this could also represent the spirit being trapped in the fractal matrix you know and they have this kind of black and white form while they're while they are formless and void so it's twofold it could literally have been the skin of the nephilim that looked like this and it also could represent the physical nature of them but then gloria jones dressed in this way with white face we'll call it um wild red hair <laughs> big red lipstick looking like a clown literally does a strip tease on this this mannequin as though she's trying to communicate with the dead <laughs> you know the spirits of the nephilim and uh, while she strips down she ends up looking something like this with black and white skin as well um and i think this is a very clear depiction perhaps in this awful 80s film about what the nephilim actually looks like I think they look something like this and it's here it is in this this film um so you know whoever whoever produced this <laughs> knew something um and this is just so on the nose this is so in line with my theory that the nephilim look like clowns that this literal vampire so what you could consider a modern uh, rendition of a nephilim looks like this like a clown as clownish as you could possibly look with black and white fractal skin. So while playing around with the AI art, you know, I someone sent me an image where they tried to create what it probably looked like, and it probably looked something like this. If you want to see more images along this line, you know, you can go and watch the uh, the video um, from my latest live stream, uh, the Truth Therapy Sessions. This is the thumbnail, and we go through many images of what these beasts, these beings, could have looked like. Uh, some more disturbing than others, some a bit more uh, light-hearted. Um, but yeah, this is what these beings probably look like, guys. Black and white skin, particularly. I thought this one was quite interesting. I do like this one. Look at this thing. So devoid of humanity, yet so clownish and jester-like. Very bizarre. So yeah, guys, another interesting tidbit there. Uh, someone showed me this film. I thought it was really interesting. Um and so on point with the theory that it, it just had to be brought into the into the mix you know don't forget the um the Hayoka tribe dressed like this too the black and white motif is such a common motif in this theory that it, it was definitely worth a mention okay guys so that's all i have for you today um i will be bringing you some more videos this week hopefully um i am quite busy with work so there's only so much i can do with my time at the moment uh, thanks to all my patrons for your support. I couldn't do this without you. Um, and if you do feel the need to support what I do, you can always find the links down below. Um, a little bit goes a long way, guys. Um, so thanks to those who have chosen to support me on there. Um, join me on my live show. I think I'll be doing another one at the end of this week, guys. And I'll leave it there for now. And as always, God bless. I want you to get together.